Hello everyone, welcome to my shop. I'm Robin and today we're starting part two of the DIY surface plate lapping and I got a ton of uh, comments and questions on the first version and uh, while I'm here I'll apologize for not listening to a uh, video before I uploaded it. I didn't realize how bad the audio was where I was trying to speed it up. So won't do that again. My apologies. And uh, there are two versions on there now, one with audio fixed and seems like they're getting equal amounts of viewing, but uh, that's okay. So um, i starting out here by uh, trying to answer um, some of these questions because there seems to be some confusion. One thing I want to say is um, I am not an expert on any of these things. Nothing I put on YouTube am I, do I consider myself an expert. My... Uh, hashtag that I use on Instagram is practitioner of the mechanical arts and that's exactly what I consider myself someone who is practicing uh, the mechanical arts and uh, doing just that practicing uh, never arriving practicing learning every day and uh, that's the way I look at these things so you're just along for my ride uh, another note that I uh, often tell my son and, and other people just because something is spoken with conviction and authority doesn't mean it's correct. So you can hear me rattle stuff off and it sounds very convincing and all that because I'm speaking it like I really believe it, which I do, um, but it doesn't make it necessarily right. So I have no problem being questioned on, uh, on these uh, things that I post and um, I'm not even assuming that everything I'm posting is correct. Uh, like I said, I'm learning every day. So um, I'm going to attempt to answer some of these things. Um, the biggest one is people were freaking out about me using the level to assess the curvature of the plate while I had the uh, large lap still sitting on there. And I think the problem here is the confusion of two separate things. One is the deformation of the surface plate itself from external loading, meaning things sitting on it, relative to the three pads that the plate sits on. That deformation uh, is one of the things that's covered in the federal specs of um, how thick the plate has to be and how stiff it has to be. And most plates are rated at a 50 pound per, per um, square foot rating and what that means is that you take the square feet of your plate times 50 pounds in this particular case it's 3 feet by 4 feet so that's 12 12 times 50 600 pounds you would put a 12 inch diameter circle in the set, dead center in the plate load it with 600 pounds and the plate must not deflect corner to corner diagonal must not bow more than half of the tolerance. So this is a double A plate. Double A plate this length, the tolerance is uh, two tenths. So that means that that plate with 600 pounds concentrated in the center must not deflect more than one ten thousandth. That's one ten thousandth bow over 60 inches, corner to corner. That's an extremely shallow bend. That would not show up in the measurements I'm doing with the level. And remember, I said, this leveling, the, the measuring I'm doing with the level is just rough. It's to be a general guidance in what I'm doing. It's not meant to calibrate the plate. I'm going to do that with the Renzimeter. So, uh, that is, people are confusing that deformation with the deformation of the support structure. Support structure meaning what? Everything from the plate down, meaning the three pads, whatever they're made of, the framework that's supporting the pads, the floor that the pads are sitting on, the earth that the floor is sitting on, all of those things when you're using level as a reference all matter. The deformation that I'm compensating for by having the weight that I move equal distance from the centers with the uh, level 
is compensating for the deformation of the support system, it's changing because of the weight distribution changing. So that's where I think people got completely confused. And um, I will be showing a clip of, uh, in this next section, after I get through all these questions, of where I actually realized I had been tweaking the level of the plate to zero the level when I was going to do a reading by adjusting my adjusters on the floor, the, the four um, threaded feet that I jack against the floor to adjust the level of the whole plate. So I was actually down there, you know, jacking, back and forth jacking. And I finally realized for the little bit I'm adjusting, all I had to do is reposition the level to shift the whole plate, the tilt of the plate, just by moving that the, the lap on top. So I was using it as a tool to actually, I'll show you using it as a tool to actually zero the level each time instead of messing with the feet. Um, so I'm a full division off here and I would need to tweak that. So normally I'd get down there with a wrench, tweak it. And I realized, wait a minute, dummy. You got this lap sitting on here. Just shift the lap and you can see the edge of the lap coming across here. So I can just move this. See the bubble move? So I can actually tweak my, my bubble location simply by shifting the lap. instead of all that bending and I can stand up here and watch the response without having to come back up and down, up and down, stoop up and down about 50 times and getting it tweaked. You can see it's, it's uh, working, its way, working its way in there. This bubble actually responds pretty fast. I don't know what they're using in here for their, for their fluid, but this is a little snappier bubble than, uh, than what I'm used to, uh, the stare. And I think this, maybe it's just my imagination, but it seems like it responds quicker. So you can see there, I still need just a tad more. So just a little nudge of the plate there. And remember, I'm still roughing here, so I don't have to be dead nuts, but I like to be so I'm not in interpolating the interpolation <laughs> and, and forget how much my zero was off and all that. So just a, a note there that um, by leaving the lap on there, I'm actually tweaking the position of the plate. And it also, <clears throat> excuse me, is a good... Uh, thing to actually show the influences of weight on the plate support system and floor and how it influences the level oh, That's where the confusion came from uh, This this is nowhere near 600 pounds and it's distributed over a large area So it is uh, yes, it is influencing plate me leaning on this plates influencing plate Yes, when you think metrology and think uh, high precision you have to think of everything as rubber this plate is flexible. Eight inch thick pink granite, it's flexible. It's, it is moving. Anything you do, push your finger down here, it's bending. Very small amounts, but um, it's bending. So never think of anything as rigid. Uh, this is an opportunity to also talk about uh, thickness of plates. Why is this pink granite plate so much thicker than um, a black granite plate? The modulus of elasticity of uh, pink granite is much less than black granite or gravo, uh, the other stone that uh, plates are made out of. So in order for it to be stiff enough to, to satisfy the deflection test I talked about, the 50 pound per square foot uh, deflection um, test, it needs to be thicker because it's more flexible. So that's why this is 8 inch. If it was black granite, it would be thinner. And it's also why you can't take a B-grade plate, and in theory, you can't just have it lapped to double A. Yes, it may be double A, but it doesn't actually follow the double A guidelines, meaning it is going to deform out of tolerance with the 50 pound per square foot rating on it. So it doesn't mean that having it, if the guy's willing to say, hey, you know, your plate's actually double A right now, and for most of the weighting that you'll do with your parts, it is. But just remember that um, if you had bought that plate as double A versus the B that it was originally made at, it would be a lot thicker to satisfy the 50 pound per square foot rating. Um, there's also a 100 pound per square foot rating where the plate would be correspondingly even thicker yet. And that's simply a beam calculation of how thick this plate needs to be to not deflect with that concentrated load of 100 pounds per square foot loaded in the center relative to the mounting feet. Okay, a person asked, um, how can you prove that, that uh, having that equal weight and moving it the equal distance from the center line of the plate when you're moving actually works? And um, 
it, there, if you want to get super, super nitpicky, way be, below the amounts that the uh, level is able to measure, because these th there's three points supporting this on the long side where you've got a single point and then two feet back here, uh, there are my, very minute differences, but in general, they can be ignored at the levels that we're working at here. And pretty much, if you put a point load here, split it in half, and move it these, as long as you equally space these, the actual moment loading on the plate that you're doing is identical, because the center of gravity of these two, seen as a unit, still comes back to here, as long as they're even and equally spaced. So you can do whatever you want with these, as far as, they're the, as long as they're the same distance this direction. You can move equally distant here all you want, and the effect is no different than the sum of those weights put right here in, this, in the middle. So that's why that um, is an effective, um, effective thing. A um, couple guys got in quite a uh, tussle over um, being able to calibrate a plate with a single level. And um, pretty much the answer to that is no. The one guy was basically saying, look, if you know, what he's doing is better than a B grade already. Um, and he's forgetting the fact that I'm, I'm actually seeing what the distortions are and taking them out. Uh, and if you don't know what, if you had really flexible springs on each of these feet, so the plate, you know, almost visibly moved, you have no idea what that stiffness is unless you, unless you compensate it. So for all practical purposes, the answer is no. You can't use a single level and do anything accurate with using level to de determine flatness by, with foot spacing and, you know, moving in equal increments and looking for the up and down and converting that angular measurement into um, rise or fall and generating a line of the topography. If you don't compensate for the amount that the uh, weight of the level is moving the whole structure, you're nowhere. So the answer is no. You, you, you're, you can't, uh, yeah, sure, if you say, well, if I'm only after five thousandths, well then, you know, what's the point? then you're just trying to win the argument by taking the things to the, to the uh, point of ridiculousness. You, you need to have a process that is technically correct, and that means you have, to, you have to be able to compensate for the error somehow. So a differential level system is ideal because it's compensating for the tilt by having a stationary one and summing the readings. Uh, the, what I'm doing here with the balanced weight distribution is, is good enough for what you can accomplish with a level. But none of that's... Uh, the electronic precision levels are accurate enough to do um, a very a very good mapping of the plate, but um, a bubble level you, you can only go so far with that. Even though it's plenty good enough for what what most people would need to get to. One of the questions was, what about the iron wearing faster than the granite? And that comes back to uh, lapping uh, some of the the um, golden rules of lapping and that is uh, one of them is that the softer material of the two, the more ductile or softer uh, of the two materials is going to tend to have the abrasive particles embed in it and it's going to do the cutting the harder piece is going to get cut uh, and that's just the laws of lapping uh, it's just the way things are um, it's just going to happen if you uh, do tumbling abrasion where you're not intentionally trying to charge lap and the differential isn't that great in the, in the hardness, you can get a situation where neither, neither charges and you get tumbling abrasion and lapping occurs. And that's fine. That is a valid, uh, as I described first, in the first one, that's, that's a valid uh, technique. Um, that also applies to people ask the question of, could you do stone on stone? Meaning, could you use two surface plates and lap them on each other without a lap and actually have both plates be, be worked on at the same time? Yes, uh, but you have to be careful there because um, unlike the three-plate method with scraping, just because you rub two pieces on each other with an abrasive in between them doesn't mean that they are perfectly matching surfaces. There's too many variables involved with uh, where the abrasive is, the thickness of the abrasive, how much overlap's going on, um, 
all the mechanics of what's going on as far as uh, what the engaged areas and how, how much areas that are more engaged, less engaged, meaning that the wear and that, and that isn't, isn't uniform um, in general. So you can't assume that they're matching as opposed to scraping where you're actually blowing them up, uh, mating them to each other and physically looking and seeing, yes, they are bearing mutually with each other and even. So you have to be very careful that the three plate method in scraping is somewhat different than lapping because your lapping technique doesn't guarantee that the two parts you're lapping on each other are actually mutually, you know, mutually the same surface. They're not absolutely guaranteed to be perfectly mating surfaces. So there's a difference there that um, you just can't take that jump and assume that, well, if I rub two stones together, uh, yes, in general terms, they're going to they're going to be good, and if you understand more nuances of the technique and everything, and the size of the particles you're using, and keeping it clean, and not having too thick of a layer, and not having hydrodynamic film build up, all kinds of things that would influence how well that mates. Um, whether the plates are one of, whether one of them is uh, grooved to relieve you know hydrodynamic uh, film effects and all that. All those things are, are things that uh, would come into play there. So stone on stone can work. Uh, you probably have to use a much finer abrasive than charged because the tumbling abrasion typically is going to give you a coarser finish for the same size diamond than it will when it's charged into a, uh, a soft metal plate like aluminum or the iron. Uh, so you would probably have to use a finer abrasive. It's also a question of uh, how can you uh, uncharge the lap? That comes back to the same principle. One thing you can do is just, uh, if you have surfaces that will, will stand it and it, it's not going to ruin your work, you can just wear, wear the, the diamond out, basically. Uh, just keep using it until the uh, cutting action drops to zero and um, then charge it with the size you want. Not going to work for super fine finishes and things, but for general work, um, that just wearing it out will work. You can also lap the lap with a softer material than the lap. So you have an iron lap that's charged. You can take a chunk of aluminum that's been milled so that you get decent contact and actually rub it over the lap to tend to pull out the um, charge of the other piece. Copper, anything ductile, grabby, that's going to have a tendency to pull the particles, grab the particles, and have them embed easier than the material it's in. Same principle again particles are going to tend to stick in the softer material. So you start rubbing a softer material against that lap, it's going to start to tend to pull pieces out of it and um, to uncharge it. But there's limits on that, but somewhat to that degree that, that works. People asked about grooving the lap. Grooving the lap probably would help in this procedure with allowing all of the uh, granite debris to go into the grooves and stay there and not build up a layer that you start to ride on a layer of granite dust. Um, but um, I don't think it's necessary. I, I haven't seen actually seen a lot of groove laps. Most all of the people that I've seen that do service plates for a living, the, the, the laps are not grooved. So um, yeah, I think it would help, but uh, it's not necessary. Uh, people asked about, uh, do you have to have a different charging roller for each size grit. It comes back to the same hard soft lap uh, situation. That's why that roller was hardened uh, A2 tool steel, probably like 62 Rockwell. By having it hard, the particles will uh, abrade it, but they won't stick into it. So as long as you wipe that off, um, it's things like if you're, if you're worried about it, you're gonna to go to a way finer grit, you can actually wipe it with aluminum foil and it will tend to actually pull, drag and pull that off, scrub it real good with um, uh, hot soapy water and, and something that will pull the charge out like that. Um, yeah, the, the charging roller is not meant to be per grit. Um, if you were doing super fine stuff, like, yeah, you know, obviously you're not going to go from 325 grit on the roller and then wipe it off and then go think you're going to charge a plate with one micron um, diamond. And, and typically you're not going to roll one micron diamond into a lap anyhow. It's, it's one of those things that just kind of uh, embeds itself. Uh, but yeah, you're not going to go that drastic and, and not have possibility of contamination. Uh, when you talk about very fine finishes in lapping, 
gauge block finishes, that type of thing. Um, contamination and just even uh, just dust from the air and things causing stray scratches is really an issue. So their absolute cleanliness, having things dedicated just to a grit size, not even handling things that are a different grit size while you're working in that level is pretty important. So this whole topic uh, we're on here about the uh, lapping action and soft being uh, soft versus hard parts and all that is why it is ideal to always use carbide feet on a surface plate if you can. Reason being that the ambient dust that falls from the air that lays on the plate, if you have carbide feet, um, they are very hard and they are not going to tend to pick up the particle and have it embed and start lapping the, the uh, granite. Uh, another thing, in, in my opinion, is to not deburr the edges of the feet whatsoever. Uh, absolutely dead sharp feet so that instead of having this nice chamfer that will guide particles to get underneath and roll under the foot, that dead sharp edge is squeegeeing things off as it comes along. So that's why, uh, like the um, Renzimeter feet here, the edges are dead sharp. Um, lapped and just left absolutely um, squeaky, squeaky sharp so that they push material out of the way, not guide it under to get started and to roll under. Because at the very low levels, ambient dust is pretty big. Some ambient dust can be well, well over a couple tenths. So uh, even though you're wiping the stuff, the stuff's raining down all the time. That's why you're constantly wiping the plate and it feels like I just wiped the plate and I wipe it again and I feel dust and I wipe it again and I feel dust and it's just raining down. So um, that's why the uh, sharp edged feet are very important. So if you really want to treat your plate well, you want it to last a long time, carbide feet, sharp edged, anything harder than the, than the granite. Uh, ceramic would work great, but not hardened steel. Um, and there's lots of things, you know, people use surface gauges all the time. There's lots of things made with that. And that's fine. That doesn't mean, uh, you know, throw everything away if it doesn't have uh, carbide feet. But if you're making something and you have the opportunity, uh, definitely carbide feet will help your plate last a lot longer. Does the plate need to be lapped at the same temperature as the uh, room that it will end up in? And, and the answer is no. The, the nominal room temperature that the plate is lapped in is irrelevant. It can be multiple degrees, tens, 20 degrees off of 68 degrees Fahrenheit, whatever, 20 degrees Celsius. It's irrelevant. What matters to the curvature of the plate is the temperature gradient, vertical temperature gradient. So that, that typical realm for that is in the 0.1 degree Fahrenheit per inch uh, in the average place to 0.05 degree per inch um, in a laboratory environment where they've got some kind of um, counterflow systems to make the vert vertical temperature gradient more consistent. That vertical temperature gradient is very critical on uh, once you get down into the double A um, plates because it will change the shape, the, the actual curvature of the plate significantly. Um, out of tolerance even if it's if it's extreme. So that is what has to be paid attention to and the spectral specs even call for a particular range of vertical temperature gradient of the plate when you're doing a double A plate or below. So uh, the answer to that question is no, room temperature doesn't matter, vertical temperature gradient of the room does. And uh, some of those things can be controlled by just having vertical circulation a slow moving ceiling fan that just is circulating the air in the room uh, counterflow wise. Uh, whatever it is, it needs to be consistent to where you measured the plate at, where you had it calibrated. And um, if you don't know what it was, if you have your plate calibrated and um, you don't know what that temperature gradient is, uh, you really, it can be significantly off. So um, most uh, I think temp the federal spec actually calls for the temperature gradient of the uh, plate when it was calibrated at AA is to be recorded so that um, people can know what the plate needs to get back to 
um, if they want to have the accuracy that it was uh, you know, originally lapped at. Some people mentioned about, wow, you know, experts couldn't do it, but I can't. That's, that's hogwash. The experts, meaning the people who lap these for a living, they came in, they started on the plate, they realized the thing's way off. Um, they're out to make a living. They have a certain amount of time that is profitable for them to do a plate. Uh, and even if, they, if the company wanted them to do it, it could easily take, at their hourly rate, could cost more to have it lapped by them than buying a new plate. So it wasn't that they're not capable. I'm not better than the than the guys who lap plates for a living, and not by any stretch of the imagination. It's just that I can I can have free time to burn to make this plate right. They could have easily uh, done this plate and made it right. It's just that the the um, economics of it didn't work out. So it's not it has nothing to do with the capability of the guys lapping it. Will I have the plate certified? Um, I'm going to be certifying the plate with the uh, Renzimeter and um, showing how it's capable of self-calibrating for straightness and be well within uh, the realm of what an autocollimator or uh, 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 differential levels would be capable of calibrating this plate. And I'll be using the same techniques of uh, doing a union jack pattern, doing the runs of the lines that form that pattern and uh, except I'll be using the Renzi meter to do that. What will I use such a large plate for? <laughs> uh, a lot of guys will tell you um, <laughs> there's no such thing as too big of a plate. As soon as you have a certain size plate you think it's big enough you get something bigger that is parts overhanging it and you're wondering what you have space for. Uh, the Mitsui rebuild behind me you're going to see that this plate is just big enough for what I want to do here. Um, I'm going to be putting the table on here, uh, the actual uh, reciprocating table part, and the entire saddle on here uh, separately uh, to be, do, be doing checks on the scraping and the straightness and twist and all those things on it. So this plate is by no stretch of the imagination too big for, for what I'm going to be using it for. Somebody said, uh, maybe I need a repeat -a meter because uh, they hadn't seen me use anything that was like a repeat -a meter Lorenzo meter is a... Um, basically a supercharged repeat -a meter It is a repeat -a meter but it can also measure uh, straightness uh, because of the uh, fact that it's reversible um, and can be reversed like that. And the leg heights are exactly the same within a few millionths of an inch. And um, that's what allows it to be self-calibrated for straightness. In the first video at around uh, the eight minute mark, I was uh, dragging my uh, carbide footed uh, surface gauge with the, the probe on the table acting as a repeat -a meter and I was saying that this is showing nice and straight and that's uh, incorrect terminology. It was a nice uniform repeat reading, meaning the needle was not moving at all, meaning whatever curvature it is, it was extremely uniform. Um, and then showing the roll off um, at the ends, so or the, the depth of the holes here. So I should have not used the term straight uh, there, which is absolutely correct. The shower curtains are strictly to um, minimize the distraction of the stuff in the background. Um, that's all it's for. There's nothing magical back there that I uh, don't want you to see other than the fact that your eyes would be all over the place instead of focused on um, uh, the plate, which is what we're trying to work on. So we mentioned about wearing a respirator. Um, their granite is a huge amount of silica and when you abrade it you have free silica and that silicosis is no joke. It's uh, extremely horrible lung problem caused by inhaling f uh, free silica. And so I've never seen any plate relappers use a mask. That and typically that's because they're hardly removing any material. They're just tweaking plates where here I had to remove a ton of material to get there. So uh, that's probably why you don't see the, um, the, the guys coming in and doing the plates wearing masks because they're careful not to stir up any dust. Um, and um, doesn't mean that wearing a mask wouldn't be a good idea, but um, I, I am wearing a mask um, in between. And I actually, since they mentioned that, I started wearing one in, in the rest of the video. Uh, just to uh, be a good example. When I showed the uh, process of gluing the three carbide feet on the um, spreader for the level to make get 11 inch foot spacing, 
And I glued them on there, implying that, okay, when I flip these over, they're going to be nice and flat. And I went and lapped it, and we saw, oh, wow, they're not that flat. Um, I realized after the fact there that those were, those were used inserts, and I did not lap them off to get rid of any build-up edge or anything that was keeping them from sitting dead flat. And that's exactly what the problem was there. When I looked at those closely, I could see that there was a little teeny build-up edge on there that that was sitting on when they glued them. And then when we went and lapped them, they... Um, they, they showed that they were sitting on a tilt. If I had carefully taken those um, individual inserts, lapped them off, made sure there was nothing but that flat plane surface on the top of the insert, uh, no build up edge anywhere to make them sit crooked, put them on the plate, glued it, they would have been, they would have been perfectly fine. So that's why that, that showed up that way and uh, when I glued the feet on. I also mentioned uh, when I got the smears on the plate, when I was dragging, it would kind of grab and I'd, you'd see the smear material there. Um, I'm realizing that that's just from not using enough abrasive. Uh, you need to use a significant amount of diamond for this to really work well. And when that thing starts to pull and, and starts to get draggy, it's because there's just not enough, just not using enough abrasive particles. It had nothing to do with any kind of oil or uh, residue or anything on the plate, purely uh, because of the lack of abrasive. Someone asked about figure eight lapping pattern. I'm not a fan of figure eight lapping pattern. And in general, on the big, huge lapping surfaces, large engaged things here, um, I'm not sure that it makes a whole lot of difference. But as far as I'm concerned, there's nothing magical about figure eight. And from my experience, um, using round laps most of the time, I find that circular, always starting on the outside edge, working my way gently to the center, because if you don't, you're going to end up with a hole in your lap. People just have a tendency to plop in the center, rub, 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 rub. Better off doing this, change direction, spin the lap so that the influences of how your body is on, uh, you know, influencing the lap, do that. The other reason is, is when you're doing precision lapping, how you influence the part, how you put loads on it that make it lean and can cause issues with how the bottom actually turns out you have to be consciously counteracting those. And when you do a straight drag, you realize that your normal tendency would be to do like this. So you're, you're actually loading the part this way as you push to make sure that doesn't happen, but maintain uniform pressure. There's all those nuances of exactly how you're manipulating the part to make it come out properly, that when you're doing this, you, you can't keep track of that. There's just too much going on. Um, and I, I find no advantage to it. Think about a regular lapping machine that has a, spinning table, carrier, those parts don't get figure eight. They get a continuously changing pattern, but there's no figure eight involved. Um, someone might be able to explain to me why there's some magic to figure eight, but they're gonna have a tough time convincing me it, it has any value. Another uh, viewer said, um, they wish, let me, let me read here. Um, some rich person needs to give you unlimited funds to do whatever I want. <laughs> so we can see what kind of crazy stuff I come up with. I think that's an excellent idea. So any, any takers, I'm, I'm up for that. Uh, so I, I like that comment. Um, I thought this was just going to be a little insert in the in the uh, rest of the uh, second video in the series here, but this is uh, darn close to um, half an hour long already. So I think I'm going to just uh, close it up here. Um, if I haven't succeeded in boring people to death with uh, 30 minutes of just yakking at you on the screen here, then uh, you, you guys are glutton for punishment. So hopefully this was uh, educational and um, informative. And uh, if, you, uh, if you enjoyed this, please uh, subscribe, thumbs up, uh, tell your friends, and uh, I'll be back.